should welcome everyone. I know people are still logging in, but thank you so much for, for spending your, your early lunch, late for early breakfast, wherever you're calling in from with us. Um, I'm, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Meredith Jacobs. I'm the CEO of Jewish Women International. Um, this is really, even though we've been doing so many Zoom events, I think we've had close to 150 since last January. I don't even know. It's crazy. We were actually doing these virtual leadership lunches a year before the pandemic hit. I remember being in my office and eating my salad at my desk, as I always seem to do, and thinking, why don't we use Zoom and use this as a time that we can learn from amazing women, but let's make it a Zoom call so that we can unmute and ask questions and talk and really make it feel like a conversation. Um, so, so it was very easy when COVID hit and everyone went virtual for us to pivot, but it's nice to bring back the concept of virtual leadership lunch. And this way, whether you're still remote or whether you're back in your office, you can join us. Um, I am so thrilled that we are also kind of unofficially sponsored today by our Women's Impact Network and our Young Women's Impact Network. So if you're not familiar with it, um, these women are supporters of JWI's mission to end violence against all women and girls. We do our work not only through healthy relationship workshops, but supporting survivors um, through our, our, li our children's libraries that we build in domestic violence shelters, teaching financial literacy to women of all ages, including those who have survived violence and lifting women's leadership because when women lead, women thrive. So I thank you for being here. And, and if this is your first event with JWI, I invite you to learn more about our work. So speaking of the Women's Impact Network, I am thrilled to introduce my friend, Sharon Slotkin, who is one of the founders and leaders of our Women's Impact Network. And Sharon will be moderating today's event with Lori Kaufman and Rena Rosner. And I thank Lori and Rena for joining us from Israel. I think we have Israel to Canada to California all over. Um, we're going to have a moderated conversation until about 1130 East Coast time. And then we're going to open it up to a Q&A. So I hope at that time you're comfortable unmuting yourself and asking questions. I'll ask you to raise your hand so we can kind of keep it organized, um, but we very much would like you to be part of this conversation. So with that, Sharon, take it away. Welcome everyone. As Meredith said, I'm Sharon Slotkin and I'm on the Women's Impact Network leadership team. It was events like this one that inspired my JWI journey. It was the opportunity to learn from and to be inspired by other women. Thank you so much for joining us for today's event. It really doesn't matter whether you aspire to be an author or a literary agent or not. It's just inspiring hearing about other women's journeys and imagining all the paths that life can take us on. Speaking of imagining journeys, Lori Banoff Kaufman began to imagine the journey of her novel, Rebel Daughter, when she learned of a love story revealed on a first century tombstone. She embar embarked on a more than 10 year quest with some of the world's leading scholars and archeologists to bring the real characters to life as accurately as possible. Before becoming a full-time writer, Lori was a strategy consultant for high tech companies. She even tried to invent a device to kill head lice, which sadly didn't. <laughs> Definitely wished I, that had worked way back when, Lori. She has an undergraduate degree from Princeton and a master's from Harvard, and she lives in Israel with her husband and four adult children. Lori joins us today with her literary agent, Rena Rosner. Rena is with the Deborah Harris Agency based in Jerusalem. She's a graduate of John Hopkins University's Writing Seminars Program. She studied at Trinity College in Dublin and holds a master's in history from McGill University. She is also an author. She is also the she is the author of the cookbook, Eating the Bible, and the novels, The Sister of the Winter Wood, which was named one of the 100 best books of 2018 by Publishers Weekly, and The Light of Midnight Stars. So now I'm going to moderate a conversation with Lori and Rena for about the next half hour, and then we'll open it up to questions from the audience. As Meredith said, 
we purposefully hold these as Zoom calls because we want you to feel like we're all sitting around the same table. So please, I hope you feel comfortable unmuting yourself and asking your question when we get to the Q&A section. So, Rena, I would love to start with you. Unless someone has gone through the process of having a book published, it's truly a mystery. And I'm sure it's changed even more in the last five to 10 years with the advent of social media influencers. So take a minute, walk us through the process. How does one get a book published? And what do you look for as an agent? Thank you. Thank you all for having me. Um, so I'll just give one second, kind of like a introduction. So I've been at the Deborah Harris Agency for about 10 years now. It is the premier and basically the only literary agency in, in Israel. Um, there are some others, but not that don't, not ones that do things in the same way that, you know, that sort of we do. Um, we represent, you know, uh, names like David Grossman and um, the estate of Yudha Amichai and Dori Rabinyan, Tom Segev, Mati Friedman. And I, myself as an agent, um, uh, have been agenting, I've been selling books for, tra uh, for translation into Hebrew, um, which is also what our agency does. We manage over 300 um, agencies and publishers worldwide for the translation of their work into Hebrew, but we also represent um, authors. I run the children's list at the office, but I also have an adult list um, as well. Um, my taste tends to be more along the lines of historical fiction, sci-fi fantasy, um, thrillers in the adult space, and middle grade, young adult, and picture books. I do everything. Um, and uh, yeah, and so I've been agenting for about, I guess I sold my first book in 2013, and I've sold over 100 books at this point in my career. Um, okay, so just to give you a little bit about me, and, uh, and that answers sort of the question about what I'm interested in, and I can go into a little bit more detail on that. Um, so uh, anything I say, though, is going to be uh, referring to traditional publishing, um, and, which is like the sort of the way... Um, you know, I think of as agented publishing, right? I can't really talk so much about self-publishing because it's not an area of my expertise. Um, so in terms of how do you get a book published in traditional publishing, right? Which is different than self-publishing or, you know, independent publishing. Um, the first thing you need to do is not just finish writing a manuscript, but also um, have a critique group or have people you trust read it and, 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 get it to the best possible place that you can. Um, and even when you think it's the best possible place you can, have more people read it and more people give you feedback. Um, so that's like definitely the most important and first thing you need to do. And once your manuscript's polished and finished to the best possible um, uh, you know, place that you can get it, that's when it would be time to write what's called a query letter, which is basically, a, you know, dear so-and-so, I'm seeking representation for my novel. Here's three paragraphs, no more than that, that just tell you what my book's about in a nutshell. It's important to state the genre, like is it um, fantasy, thriller, you know, literary fiction, adult, age range, middle grade, YA, you know, um, and then also a little bit about yourself. Different agents are going to have different submission guidelines. Um, some want uh, the first five pages or 10 pages pasted into the email under the query letter. Some people like me, I like to have the first 50 pages attached. Other people don't like attachments. You know, everybody has different ways that they work and the submission guidelines are important because there are different ways in which we work. I send all my submissions to my Kindle and like to read from my Kindle. And that's why I want attachments. And if I don't get an attachment and then I have to ask for it, it's like adding another step in the process, right? And then, and then the submission comes in and there's an attachment, but I've already moved on to something else, right? If this, for me, if the attachment's there, it goes right to my Kindle and I know I'll read it later. So that's what works for me. Um, and uh, I think that the best thing to do is to start by querying like 10, 15 agents, not more than that. Um, what I used to do, and this relates to something we said we'd talk about later, but I remember when I was a querying author, um, I would send about I send my queries out in about batches of 10. And then whenever I get a rejection, I'd send out to like two more. That was like my fight back. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, but it's good to kind of keep it on that scale. Um, not that you can't send to 30 at a time, but I wouldn't recommend sending to a hundred at a time. Having said that, it took me 
about over a hundred queries in about 10 months to get my first agent. It's not an easy process and it's not for the faint of heart. <laughs> um, but once you get, once you get an agent, once an agent reads your, your manuscript, falls in love with it and says two things for me, it's always two things. One, I love the writing here. And two, I think I can sell it. And one has to go with the other because if something's an amazing book, but I don't think I can sell it, meaning I'm not sure there's a place for it in the market, meaning I know editors and I speak to them all the time. And I've spent years developing relationships with people in better days. I used to go to New York two, three times a year, spend an entire week from seven in the morning, straight through cocktails, dinners, you know, seeing editors in New York city, getting to know them on a personal level, also getting to know what they're looking for. And, and so I'm lucky that it hasn't really, COVID hasn't affected my work at all because I have spent 10 years building those relationships and people know me and people email me and people know, you know, they move houses. I'm going to get an email saying I'm finishing up and moving to a new house. Please, here's my email, submit to me over there. Or even, um, even editors send me authors. They're like, this is an amazing manuscript or someone I work with, they're looking for a new um, agent. You know, you get to a point in your career but that you don't really need um, to be sort of like putting yourself out there um, anymore. Uh, then that's what I would say about social media. Like, I don't think that anything's changed in the way I agent because of social media um, in the sense that like, I don't really pay attention to influencers and stuff like that. I'm looking for good writing. Um, almost all of my clients were signed from what we call like the slush pile, meaning you send a cold query, you don't know me, there's no connection to me. And I, if I fall in love with your words, I'm going to want to sell your work if I think that I can sell it, if I think there's a place in the market. Um, to, I guess to use an example, I'd love to use this example for about Lori. When your book came in, um, both Deborah and I read it and loved it and couldn't stop talking about it. Mm -hmm. And um, and then others in the office started reading it. And then we were all talking about it, you know, and that's when you get to the stage where you're like, okay, we, we know we love this. We know we can sell it. We want to take it on. It was, you know, we all got invested. Um, and, and ultimately an agent, when an agent's invested in your career, then they're going to be your, they're going to fight for you in, you know, in all the areas. They, they have the film contacts, they have the publishing contracts, and there, there is a buffer between you and your editor so that you only talk about the positive things and not, you know, any of the, um, the more difficult conversations. Um, anyway, I don't want to take up too much of your time and I'm happy to answer questions later. It, that's in a nutshell, I guess, what the, the, the road looks like for traditional publishing. Great. Rena, thank you so much. Lori, from the other side of it, share with us your journey. How did you go from being a high tech strategy consultant and, um, head lice entrepreneur again <laughs> please for all those moms out there with girls with long hair <laughs> bring that back to author how did you okay. how'd you go from one to the other share with us so I've always had um I'd say a very non-linear career path with a lot of successes and a lot of failures uh, but I always was enamored with writing, um, an avid reader, and I wanted to write. And when my husband and I were in grad school, we actually published the Boston Ice Cream Lover's Guide. And then we got an agent and we got a contract to write the Dessert Lover's Guide to York. Then uh, I got pregnant with my first child and my husband got offered a job in Israel and we decided to make Aliyah. So it was one of those sliding door moments when your life goes in, in a different path. And writing was very hard to fit into that path. I think that writing, unlike other creative pursuits, like maybe gardening or cooking or painting, it's, it's much harder to justify, especially if you have kids, a career, um, community involvement, you're trying to exercise and fit everything in. And it's just hard to justify, at least for me, it was very hard to justify writing because you have nothing to show for it. You know, even if you're trying to say perfect the ultimate chocolate chip cookie, you know, you can still eat your mistakes, but you may write and write for years and never show a word to anyone. So um, if felt slightly indulgent, I think. Uh, maybe that's the word. Um, I couldn't justify it. But when I turned 50, um, I had one of those now or never moments and the stars were perfectly aligned. My kids were older. I didn't need a, um, a steady paycheck, you know, like I did in the beginning. I had a great idea. 
and I decided to go for it. So of course, I didn't know it was going to take me 10 years to write the book <laughs> and then another two in the publishing pipeline. So I'm not sure I would have been so eager to go for it if I had known that I was embarking on a 12 year effort and that I'd be a debut author at close to age 62. But um, I think that I am proof that it's never too late. But I'd also like to say, as I was thinking about what I was going to say today, that it's also never too early. I mean, the truth is that there's really never a right time. And um, I think that there's always something else that we as busy women feel like we should be doing. I mean, you could always clean out the mold in the vegetable drawer, right? You could always do another load of laundry. And it takes a lot of um, courage. And, and we'll talk about this more later, I'm sure, but uh, you have to really have a lot of strength to be able to say, okay, I'm taking this time for, to do what I want to do. And, you know, there's no direct payback for anyone in this family and maybe not even for me, but I'm going for it. And it probably took me maybe longer to make that leap than for other people, but that's, uh, that was my journey. Thank you. And um, yes, it, it definitely does take, take a lot to start to believe in yourself, to put yourself out there and do it. And um, we're all glad that you took that leap. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like I'm actually very much looking forward to reading your book now that I've learned so much about it. Um, Rena, I'm sure that in the publishing world, you get used to hearing no, but I imagine that sharing your writing and your art, um, as you know, we've talked about, is so personal and it must be hard not to be affected by the negative feedback. How do you help your authors continue to feel hopeful? Um, and for those of us listening, help us sort of learn how handle how you handle rejection in life, which of course inevitably happens for all of us in different ways every day or you know at different times. Sure. Well, just to respond a little bit um, to what Lori said, I um, I studied writing. I I got into Johns Hopkins University's writing program when I was you know for university, and um, it was like they only took fifteen new, you know freshman ever it was like a big deal and I was going to be a writer that was it you know um and then you know life happens I got married I had kids I have five kids um I was always writing but I was always writing for other people I was working in grant writing and I was working in journalism and I was working and it wasn't until I was about 30 that I said okay now it's your, now I don't want to, I don't, I want something that has my name. I don't want to write for other people anymore, you know? And yeah, you got a byline, but I wanted like something I could hold <laughs> that was mine with my name on it. So um, yeah, like after the birth of my third child, while, you know, I put my kids to bed at seven, which doesn't happen anymore. Cause now I have three teenagers in my house and they never go to bed. Um, but I would put my kids to bed at seven and then I would sit down and write every night. And then every day I'd pick up where I was the day before. And I just forced myself to do it. I would say that Na NaNoWriMo, which is National Novel Writing Month, I think it's every November, had sort of just begun around that. And that gave me the initial push to start. Um, so I would say in terms of rejection, like there's two things. First of all, is community, like find a community, find other authors that are going through it together with you. Um, there's like a site on Facebook called The Binders, like Binders of Aspiring um, novelists is one of them. And there's a lot of different binders, which are binders of women, which like long story, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with what, what it is. Um, and that was definitely, um, a little bit of a community for me. I also found other online communities, other people who were writing in the same space, and that'll help you get through the rejection because you see that other people are going through it too. Um, as an agent, yeah, you've got to have really thick skin because I get like 30 rejections a day <laughs> for my clients, for books that I said, this is the best thing I've ever read, right? Like, I'm in love with this. You have to buy it. Um, and I sell, I'd say 75 to 80% of the projects I take on, which is high, um, you know, but every single book I've ever sold has been rejected. 
And that's just part of the process. And a rejection really isn't a rejection of you. It's somebody saying this, I don't have the passion for this project enough to take it to where it needs to go. And I really think that finding an agent and then an agent finding an editor, it's really a just every project I take on is worthy of publication. And it's about finding the right match, finding the right agent who has the passion for your work. And then find, I have to find the right editor and the right film agent and the right producer, right? Who has the passion for the work. And that can take years. I've had books that have sold in 24 hours and I've had books that have sold 24 months later. And I never gave up because I believed in it. And I really do believe that every book I haven't been able to sell was only because I didn't find the right editor or it wasn't the right time. I've also had books that like we've said, okay, let's put this aside and, you know, working with a client, let's work on your next book. And then we've gone back to, I'm like, but remember that? I think that now's the time for that book. All of a sudden, you know, the queen's gambit's on and everybody's talking about chess. And I have a book that I tried to sell that chess two years ago that nobody wanted to take a look at. So that changes. And that is also like the job of an agent is to be reading trends and looking at what's, you know, um, what's working and why and what's selling and why and what's hot now. Even though in publishing, we are always like sort of a, a, a process that deals in futures because any book that I sell now doesn't come out for at least 18 months, if not longer, right? So nobody in publishing is buying a book that's going to be published now, but we still have to kind of like keep our, you know, fingers on trends. What are people going to want to read a year from now, which nobody knows, especially in the age of COVID, like who knows what's going to be tomorrow, right? Let alone like a week from now or a month from now or two years from now. But I think that's why publishing wasn't as affected, first of all, because people continue to read always but also because editors who are buying books, anything that's coming out now, they bought two years ago. So it is what it is. It's going to come out and it's going to do what it's going to do. And there's nothing you can do about it. But if you don't buy a book now, you won't have a book come out 24 months from now. And so it's, you know, anyway. Um, so yeah. And, and my other, my other piece of advice, which I said before is like, for me, every time I got a rejection, I turned around and sent out another query you know, just to like keep on going. If you love writing and you love publishing and you want to be a published author, just don't give up, never give up. And it took me, I went through three agents and three manuscripts until I sold my debut. Um, and it took about, about 10 years also. <laughs> Resilience, right? Resilience, grit. It's all those things that we talk about of how important it is in life to be able to kind of keep on going. Um, you know, one other one thing just on what you were saying when you were talking about how what you're buying now you, you know what you're what you're selling now is actually not going to be published for a couple of years um so meaning that what's been coming out in the past year when we've all been you know dealing with what nobody knew was going to happen to our world um was actually decided on two years ago have you seen though in what you're receiving now has it been impacted by um, COVID and the pandemic? And are we gonna sort of see this influx of books in a couple of years that were impacted by this period of time that we've all been sort of in our homes? I think that we've been a little bit hesitant to take on books that are you know, in directly address COVID, though I have seen some sell. Um, I think also we've had a lot of conversations in publishing about like, well, what do you do with a book that's set in 2022? it's gonna to have to address what the last year looked like, right? Um, and so some books are, it's like starting a little bit, but I think people are also just hesitant because you don't wanna date something. And also who knows what's gonna be in 2022 when it comes out, you don't wanna make your book feel dated. Um, so, you know, it's had an impact in that sense. I also think a lot of people have been home and had a lot of time in their hands and have written my inbox. I have more queries in my inbox than ever before. And that's um, something that I'm hearing from a lot of agents and also from a lot of editors. We're like swamped in a way that we don't remember in a long time. So I'm happy that people have been creative during this time, <laughs> but it's been a little overwhelming on this end, I will say. I'm sure. Um, I know a couple of people have their hands raised and I'm going to go to your questions in just a moment. But before we do, Lori, I've got a question for you. Tell us a little bit the story of Rebel Daughter. And even though um, the characters are based on real people, what is it like sort of to be responsible for creating a life and a world mm -hmm. in a novel? So Rebel Daughter is about a young woman who is 
taken as it was taken captive after the destruction of Jerusalem in the first century, sold as a slave in Rome, and she's freed by her owner who falls in love with her. And the thing that drew me to this story, um, what is that it's a true story. And this is this ancient love story really happened. So I did feel a responsibility to these real people, these real historical characters, as well as other historical characters in my novel, like Josephus, to tell their story as accurately as I could. And then I also felt a tremendous obligation to my readers. I've always been a big fan of historical fiction. And the first thing I want to know after I read a book is how much of this is really true. And so I wanted to really give the reader an authentic experience. And I didn't even want to give a, so much an intellectual or a reading experience. I wanted to um, transport the reader back 2000 years to first century Jerusalem. I wanted, I was looking for a time travel experience, not just a fast paced gripping story. I really wanted the reader to feel like um, she was there. I wanted the reader to feel, you know, the hot stones of this, this market street, to smell the spices, to feel her eyes burn from the smoke of the animal sacrifices. And you can't bluff that. You really have to know in order to really recreate this, this world. Now, I admit in retrospect that I totally overdid it <laughs> and it was total overkill. And I checked out everything. I worked with some of the world's leading historians, archeologists of the first century. I walked on the very streets that my characters walked on. And I you know, wanted to know what they ate and how they dressed and what the houses were like and really, um, kind of took it to an obsessive level, <laughs> which is why it took 10 years of research and writing. But having said that, I think that it does give the book, um, it sets the book apart. It's, it's authentic in a way that most historical fiction, um, I think, says it is. But this, because this was 2000 years ago, there was a lot more that I had to learn about before I could write with um, confidence. So thanks. Yes, I'm a big historical fiction reader myself. And I do find that after I read a book, I spend some time looking into how much of it actually happened was. Right. True. So that's great. Again, really looking forward to reading the book. Miriam, I know you've got a question. So do you want to go ahead and unmute yourself and sure. please share? Okay. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes. Um, yeah. So thank you. This is so great. Um, I really am connecting to this. Um, I am an academic actually, and I have a book published with Ben Gurion University Press on the topic of how Israel studies is taught at universities. <laughs> this was 10 years ago, this was my dissertation. And a lot of the um, hype around academic publishing is very similar to what you've been talking about. And I'm so happy you guys are in Israel because that's always, you know, that's been harder for me as an academic in America. I'm currently working on a topic that um, I've presented at, I just recently at a, a academic conference, but I would like um, academic presses have such limited readership. I really would like this to have a broader readership. So I guess what I'm, um, and it's just, you know, in the beginning phases. So I would guess my question is, you know, how often do you have um, I'm, not, I'm not heavy on academic jargon because I deal with historical topics and educational topics and philosophy, but how often does the academic make the transition from um, writing that involves a lot of footnotes and archival documentation to the telling the story that's based on the archival research, but I'm not, nobody is gonna go and look up this sentence and find the archive that is I'm referring to. Not that people do that for academic publishers anyway, publishing, but you know, you're writing as if they are. So that's my question, you know, how often, I guess, I don't know if you know, do people make that transition? And you know, what do you recommend for someone like me? <laughs> Thank you. Do you want me to answer or Lori? <laughs> um, um, I, I guess so. Yeah. yeah, okay. Um, all right. 
Um, I would say, well, first of all, like our agency does have some authors that we work with who are more in the academic space. I think that if you want to try to get into certain places like Yale University Press or, you know, there's certain um, presses that are like we work with Princeton and Harvard University Press and, and some things like that. Also, I do a lot of poetry. And so I'm, I'm often in conversation with university presses because those are a very good market for um, for poetry. And, and that is a space that crosses over. And so it depends. It really depends on the on the topic. Um, so there are, I think, some academic books that are there are a little more highbrow. Um, and there are academic books that are a little bit more popular in that space. You know, there's there are books that ride that line. Um, and those are the kind of books that like an agent would represent. Um, and beyond that, though, in terms of taking it to the next level, you know, my books um, were actually also very historically based, and I did a ton of research. They're historical fantasy, let's say. Um, but in my my end notes, I list all the sources that I used and all the inspiration that I used and everything is, and I, I'm, I obsess, I think I have a master's in history, you know, and um, I can't write without like doing a, a ton of research. I just finished working on a book about Hannah Senesh and we'll see what happens, but I like every word I checked. So I, I think that it's the same skills really, okay. you know, and I think it's just taking it from a place of having to footnote everything to being like, okay, I don't have to footnote everything. Um, and I can make it really interesting and easy to read, but it doesn't change the fact that if you're a historian, you're still checking every word, you're still checking every detail, as right. Lori said. Right. This is so um, interesting. The book on Hannah Senesh, is that yours or you're representing? That's actually mine. We'll see what happens. Oh, okay. I'll have to look because my, my current topic <laughs> is a Hungarian actress who saved Jews. And that's mm. why I would like mm. to bring her and she's becoming very famous in Hungary now. So I'm mm. using archival material in Hungarian and in English. And, you know, that was one reason um, for my previous book, I didn't have an agent because I just did what you guys have been saying, you know, sending it out so many times and all of that. But I'll look for your book and I'll let somebody else. I don't want to hog the conversation space. Thank you so much for this. <laughs> Thank you, Miriam. Um, Saskia, you. it looks, I know we've got a few questions in the chat, which I'll get to in a moment, but um, Saskia, you've had your hand raised for a while. So do you want to go ahead and share your question? Yes, thank you. Um, thank you, everyone, uh, Lori and Rena, for zooming in from Jerusalem. Um, so my question is, um, I guess to Rena, I've noticed that you had a background in writing and you still write, but you're also representing writers. And I used to work in literary management um, in Hollywood, like helping with screenwriters and directors. And um, I, but I'm also a writer. And sometimes when I would tell people that they viewed it a little bit as like a conflict of interest, like I feel that if I were, um, if I were to go out and work as a literary manager, um, but I'm also a writer, it would be a little bit like, well, who, who are you loyal to? Who are you gonna vouch for? Are you gonna vouch for yourself? Are you going to vouch for your clients? So I'm just really curious um, from your point of view, how you sort of balance that. Yeah, I think I wear two hats, you know, like I wear the hat of like, I'm an agent and that, and then I wear the hat of like, I'm an author. And it's important, I think to me, like, first of all, I think there's a difference between authors who represent themselves and authors who, um, who are also agents, right? Um, there aren't that many uh, of us because it's seen as a little bit tacky. So like I have an agent, just like any other author, um, who's not at my agency, I, and I need that barrier for myself, and I need somebody that I can be a writer with also, that I can be, like, neurotic, and, like, why haven't they emailed us back, and I'm having a hard time, and, you know, I need someone to advocate for me, because I don't ever want to be unprofessional um, in front of the publishing world, and the agent helps me manage that. Um, there are a lot of other agent friends of mine who are also authors. It's, like, kind of, you know, you love writing, and you love books, and so, it, for me, it was natural. Like I didn't, my husband always says to me like, well, you know, maybe one day you'll quit agenting and, you know, just be a writer. And I'm like, no, being an agent and a writer enables me to just kind of like do what I love all the time, you know? And um, I'm very able to separate it. I think a lot of people in the industry know that people do both and they're able to separate it. And I think that there's one, I give a lot of added value to my clients because I know what rejection feels like. And because I know what it is to wait to hear back from an ad, you know, right now I'm waiting to hear back from this, novel I have on submission and it's killing me. I'm refreshing my inbox all the time. And I'm like, oh man, that's how my authors feel, you know? And I think it makes me a better agent. I think it, 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 I know how they feel. And so I'm trying always harder to like 
respond as quickly as I can so that you're not waiting on me, you know? Um, and obviously that's not always possible, but I do my best. Um, so I think it gives me a lot of empathy and I think it makes me a better agent, honestly. Thank you, Rena. Um, okay, we've got a bunch of questions um, in the chat, but before we do, Lori, I've got a question for you. Mm -hmm. How did you go about your process of finding your agent? How did you end up with Rena? Can you tell us a little bit about how that happened? Okay, so even though it was torturous for me to finish the book <laughs> and research the book and write the book, I think that I, um, just got lucky, you know, in Israel, I sent the book in. And I think within just a few days, it was basically on Thursday. And I think by the end of the weekend, I had an offer. So um, wow. I think that's very unusual. Um, and um, I, from what I've heard, it's very, very unusual. So, <laughs> but I did pay my dues for getting the damn thing. <laughs> So I deserved a little luck. <laughs> yes, it definitely sounds like you did. Um, Tammy Dolan, I know you've got a question. Um, do you want to go ahead and unmute yourself and ask? Sure. Thank you. Um, thank you both. It's so interesting. Um, I have two questions and one is a very personal empowerment question. Um, but the first one is a little easier and that's how does, how does one identify an agent or a publisher for a narrow interest nonfiction book? And the, the more personal question is, how do you know when you have found your voice as a writer? Okay. Um, well, so in terms of finding an agent for something more narrow, the most, I think the best tools in the, in the industry, in my opinion, um, well, I, is there's something called Publishers Marketplace. It, you do have to pay to have access to it, but it's not a lot. I think it's like $25 a month and you don't have to sign up for a year. You could pay like on a monthly basis, um, but that's where you see kind of in real time agents reporting their deals and you can really search the database for, um, you know, specific keywords and whatever. And you see like the books that are actually like almost every agent reports their sales in there. However, there's also something called Publishers Weekly, which is free. And I'm pretty sure that their deal reports, they have deal announcements. Um, the children's division has them twice a week. The adult division, I don't know, it might just be once a week, um, but that's a place where also agents list their deals. And I don't think you need to be a subscriber to access the, um, you can sign up for like a newsletter that it, it gives you like the, the children's deal reports for sure. Um, and the adult as well. I'm pretty sure you don't need to be a member. You can also buy a subscription to publishers weekly, but that's a lot more money. It's like $300 a year and you have to buy a year. Um, so that those are two, two, I mean, when I'm looking for editors to send a manuscript to, that's where I go. And if I had a narrow interest nonfiction that I was trying to pitch, that's where I would go to try to see who else had done similar things. Um, Lori, when did you find your voice? How would you say that like you? Okay, so that seems to me the kind of question that um, you don't really need to worry about. It's just, there's all this author writer advice that I think is, um, people spend too much time worrying about. I think you get in, you don't worry about it. You don't worry about your muse. You get in, you do your work. Um, I think that obviously there's an element of, you know, as they call it craft where you have to have the grammar and you wanna have the right structure and the conflict and great characters. But I think voice is one of those um, things that writers talk about, like that this is some mythical, magical process that I have access to and nobody else has to. It's, I think it's overrated. <laughs> I think if you write something that interests you and interests other people, and then you send it to other people and you get people's comments, that's the work. Um, all the, the muse and the inspiration and the voice and all these, these intangibles, I wouldn't worry about. I think it's, um, to me at least, I think that that's the kind of thing that scares people and keeps them away from writing. Because they're thinking, oh my gosh, I don't have the voice. I don't have, you know, the inspiration. My characters aren't talking to me. They're not running away and, and doing things that I didn't expect. You know, the way that sometimes these writers talk about this magical process. I look at it more as work. <laughs> and there are things you have to learn 
but I don't think it's quite as, you know, um, woohoo, you know, voice and, and mystery as people say. So I wouldn't worry about that. I think that good writing is good writing. And that's what I look for when, when I find good writing. Um, that's what I'm interested in because the plot you can work on. Um, definitely like I have authors who uh, we've tried to sell like let's say a YA book or two or three and it's not selling. And then I've said, well, why don't you try middle grade? Let's try something. Why don't you try adult? Let's move into a different space and see if that works. Maybe for whatever reason, your voice isn't working in this space. And then I've seen authors open up. But that's a very different thing. Like I didn't need that. I didn't need the voice in order to sign the client. I saw the talent in the writing. I saw it on the page. And together we're trying to transition. And I've done that. I have an author who we went on submission with four YA books and it just wasn't working. And I said, why don't you try to turn this into adult? And we sold it to Little Brown. <laughs> so, you know, I think that voice is a little more nitpicky when you get down to it and an agent knows how to identify good writing and talent. Great, Rena, thank you. So sort of on that note, um, one of our participants, Amanda Moskowitz, who was not able to be on video has a couple of questions. Um, and one of them, Rena, is what advice do you have for figuring out which agents you should query? Do you find agents that represent similar books who work with publishers you want? Like what would be your advice as sort of how to make that initial list of who to send your query to? So I think that, I mean, the Publishers Marketplace, Publishers Weekly is the same kind of, you know, it's a good place to see like what are agents selling and, you know, looking at different agents. Um, besides that, there's a website also that didn't exist when I was querying. Um, it's called MSWL. Um, my, one of my agent friends actually created it as like a hashtag on Twitter, which is like manuscript wish list. And it was designed to be a place where like editors could let agents know what their manuscript wish list is, like what they're looking for. And then like, um, agents could let authors know what they're looking to find in their inbox. And there is a website, I think it's just mswl.com or it might be manuscriptwishlist.com like written out. Um, and, um, it's updated every once in a while and, and both editors and agents put on like their wish list and stuff like that on there. So I know certainly a lot of new editors and newer agents will, you know, make sure that their MSWL pages, um, updated so that you can know like more in real time, sort of what they're looking for. Cause yeah, an agent might've sold a lot of YA fantasy and they might not want any more of that now, right? So just because an agent sold a lot of YA fantasy doesn't mean that they necessarily want to do another one, um, they may be looking more for contemporary. They may be deciding that they're moving more towards adults. So that's a place. And a lot of agents and editors now have their own like websites, like my own, my website, renarosner.com. Um, you can go and see like, what are my interests and what am I looking for? So that's another thing, like, you know, looking up agents' personal websites, more and more of us are doing that to kind of give ourselves a space where we can just change it whenever we want and not rely on like, you know, another search engine or whatever. Mm -hmm. So as a follow-up, I'd, like I'd like to just add one thing um, from as an outsider okay. perspective. I know that Rena does take things from the slush pile, but from my writer friends, I think it's almost, I'd say virtually impossible to get an agent without some kind of um, connection or community um, that it really helps to, um, you know, take a course and maybe the instructor knows an agent to tell you to go to. Even getting to um, Rena's agency, I got there through another one of their author friends whom I know. And I have a feeling that coming in through the door of with someone that they already knew made it much more likely that they looked at it th that day as opposed to four months later when Rena's slush pile got down to a normal level. Um, and there are a lot of ways to make these connections. There are, I, I've seen on uh, Twitter, even charity auctions where, um, auth where agents will critique and look at your work and it's cheap. It could be like some of these prizes go for a hundred dollars, which, you know, after you think of how much, you know, how much you've put into this, maybe it's worth spending that. Um, or conferences, a lot of conferences, you have the ability to, to as part of the conference package, you can, you get a few minutes to pitch to the agents. So, you know, you can try to send blindly, but from my perspective, it's, um, it's really hard to get it that way that you, 
if you can somehow, you know, make a connection with the agent, even their Instagram account or Twitter or some way, I think sending it into the slush pile is really difficult. That's, that's at least my I mean, I actually don't like it when people reach out to me on social media, like in that way. I think that it's better. Like, um, The w- ways in which you can reach out to agents is like interacting with them in a positive way, not in a way like I have a book I want to pitch you, right. but more in a way of just like, you see agents that are talking about Jewish stuff. You Like people start conversations with me. A lot of my clients have ended up coming from Twitter. There's a lot of like pitch events on Twitter. I mean, Twitter is a bit of a hellscape right now because of um everything that happened in Israel in the past month um it's really hard to be like um you know a positive um like openly Israeli woman on Twitter right now um I got my own share of death threats um in the last month but it is a wonderful space for writers and there are a lot of like pitch events where you like pitch your novel and and agents look for and I found clients that way um but I've also found clients who are just like chat with me about stuff, you know, and like, and then I see their name in my inbox and I'm like, oh, we were just talking about like, you know, Spanish heritage and Judaism on Twitter. Like I know who this person is, you know, so there's in that way, I would say, rather than like, just to give a (laughs) don't harass us. (laughs) Well, for example, I'm on a, I'm on a a Facebook group of um, kidlet, Jewish kidlet it's called. And there's a, there are a lot of agents on that group and we have great discussions. I feel like I've met some of the agents through that group. And, and that's what I mean about interacting um, in a positive way. That's right. In a positive way. Right. Of course. Rena, Lori, thank you so much. I know I am sure we could probably keep going on for another hour, but um, in respect for everyone's time, since this is supposed to be a lunch um, event, we're gonna try to sort of wrap it up at this point. Um, As Meredith and I both said at the beginning, this event was sort of informally sponsored by um, the JWI's Women's Impact Network which if you would like to hear more about anybody who's on this call, please reach out to me, to Meredith, to Alyssa, to one of us. Um, But we are hoping to be able to start having some events in person, in real life this fall. And it's an opportunity to be able to be with other women and be inspired and hear people's stories and talk to them and connect with them. So I urge you to learn a little bit more about it and support JWI in the process. Um, I'm gonna now turn this over to Alyssa, who's going to um, wrap things up for us. But thank you again, Lori, Rena. it was amazing. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having us, yeah. Thank you, Sharon. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. I'm Alyssa Barron, and I'm JWI's Director of Women's Impact. First of all, thank you so much, Lori, Rena, and Sharon for your time and this wonderful discussion. I think a couple of months ago, I actually mentioned to Meredith, I was like, I want to write a book one day. And this was, this was so helpful. So thank you. Um, and thank you to everyone who is attending today's virtual leadership lunch um, or breakfast for those of us on the West Coast. We're grateful for your support as JWI works to ensure that all women have the tools to thrive. And we're looking to seeing you all in person this fall at our Women's Impact Network um, launch events, as Sharon mentioned. We are using the summer to plan ahead, and we will be slowing down on programming, you know, as summer schedules get busy and everything. So we'll be emailing you any updates regarding the Women's Impact Networks and any upcoming virtual leadership um, lunches. Also, if you know of any young Jewish women looking for leadership opportunities, um, let them know that we just opened our applications for our six of our Young Women's Impact Network cities, uh, DC, Chicago, New York, Los Angeles, Denver, and San Francisco. And we'll also have an exciting new opportunity for any women who want to be involved in JWI programming but live outside of those network cities. Um, And we're gonna be calling those ambassadors and we'll be launching them this summer. So feel free to reach out to me if anyone has any questions about the Women's Impact Network or Young Women's Impact Network. I'll go ahead and type my email in the chat here in a second. And yeah, thank you all for your time. Lori, Rena, Sharon, thank you again. And we hope everyone has a wonderful rest of their day. I'm going to go ahead and put my email in the chat for anyone who wants to connect. Thank you, everybody.
Thank you again, Rena, Lori, and Sharon. Um, wonderful. Be safe. That was horrifying when you shared, Rena, about what your experience oh. online. I know Jane brought I'm like, up. I just don't want to tell anybody to go on Twitter right now and be like <laughs> responsible for anybody else. It's just a really difficult space right now. Uh, I will say if you want, I mean, I don't want to get like an influx of like a hundred emails tomorrow, but um, I am happy to, you know, kind of share my submission guidelines or whatever, and you can send it out to everybody who was involved. Um, and, you know, not so much for questions, but more if you have a manuscript that you'd like to send that's ready and edited, and you spent a lot of time honing to make it perfect. Um, Wonderful. But, you know, send that yes. to me, and then we'll, <laughs> we'll share it on um, when we send the follow-up email to this event, and we'll do it that way. But thank you so much for that. And Lori, good luck with the book. Thank you. Thank We're you all excited much. to read it. And you'll all get a link. It's Prime Day, so it's a great time to order the book. We'll be sharing the link. Um, <laughs> Thank you so much. Lori's book. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Like okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye.